really like it. <laughs> okay. Hi everyone, welcome to today's talk with Louise from Edge Hill University. As part of Hello Future Live, we're going to be talking about adult learners and do an introduction to HE for them. I'm Rosa, I'm the graduate intern for the West of Cumbria for Hello Future, which is a group of Hello, uh, higher education institutions that are all working together with the shared goal of helping you to access higher education, whether that be through a university degree or a degree or higher apprenticeship. So. I will now pass over to Louise, uh, who is going to be delivering our talk today from Edge Hill. So thank you very much. Take it away, Louise. Thanks, Rosa. I'll just get my slide ready. OK, brilliant. So hello, uh, first of all, and welcome to this session. It's an introduction to higher education and also Edge Hill University as well. So we're going to do an introduction to the university. My name is Louise McRae and I'm a recruitment officer for Edge Hill University. And I work mainly with access to HE diploma students and mature students. And I've put my contact details on the final slide of the presentation. So please feel free to contact me if you've got any questions about any aspect of the higher education process. It doesn't just have to be about those two topics. So this is what we're going to cover for the presentation today. There's quite a lot to cover. So uh, luckily for you, it's, it's recorded. So you can pause if you need to pause me to go and get yourselves a brew or a comfort break. Um, and I'm going to try not to talk too much because it is only an introduction. I've built it as an introduction. So I'm going to try not to talk too much, but there's quite a lot to get through. So firstly, I'll give you a little bit of information about the university that I work for. And that's Edge Hill University. And then we'll cover some general things about higher education. So we'll cover the benefits of higher education, look at different routes into higher education and ways that you can gain the qualifications to get you into university as well. And then we'll have a chat about choosing the right course and the right university for you. Um, and then some information on student experience, how to apply and a little bit on student finance as well. So as some of you may know, um, Edge University is a campus university, which means a university that's situated on one site with all of your teaching, living and leisure facilities available within that site. The campus is quite large. Um, it's 160 acres to be precise. So it's quite a big campus. So it's around a quarter of a mile wide and about a mile long. So it's quite a nice long walk if you need to get from one one side of the campus to the other. We've got around 15,000 students at any one time, and that inclu includes around 8,500 full-time students um, that are undergraduate students that are on our Onscare campus. We also have another smaller city centre campus in Manchester for our ODP students, uh, which is operating department practitioner students and paramedic students as well. So, but I'll talk more about our, our Onscare campus and tell you a little bit about our Manchester campus later. Uh, Ormsgate campus has shops, it's got cafes, we've got a Starbucks and a subway included in those as well. We've got a large sports complex with a swimming pool and a gym and a theatre as well, so lots of things to do in your downtime. It's a whole living experience and it's available on one site and that actually offers a completely different experience to a city university where your accommodation may be in one part of the city, your morning lecture in another part of the city and then an afternoon lecture might be on you know completely opposite side of the city. Now some students come to us and, and they wish for the campus experience and they thrive in the community feel that a campus experience cultivates but actually some students really want the buzz of a busy city on a daily basis as part of their university experience and obviously it's entirely up to you to decide which type of university experience best suits you and your needs it's a very personal thing I think choosing your university. So I don't know how many of you are local to Edge Hill, but even if you are local, you may not know exactly where the university is. So it might just be useful to quickly, quickly show you on a map. So the journey from your from um, Liverpool to Edge Hill takes about 20 minutes on the train from Manchester. It's about 40 minutes on the train. Um, and as you can see from the map, we're situated between Liverpool and Preston. Um, and we're about 30 minutes from from Preston by car as well. Um, as I previously mentioned, we have a campus in Manchester, which is just by Piccadilly, so it's really central. It's called St James's, uh, and we run our paramedic practice course from there, um, solely our paramedic course from there. Um, but you can also study operating department practitioner course from there, which I've also mentioned. And I'll mention a little bit more about our health facilities later on in the presentation as well. So just a, a quick little bit about the history of the university. We're a relatively new university and we gained university status in 1996, but we're by no means new to education. 
it's just that we were classed as a college before that. We actually opened in 1885 in a suburb of Liverpool uh, called Edge Hill, believe it or not. Um, and back then we were a teacher training college for women only. So we opened in January of that year with 41 students. So a little bit of a difference from the 15,000 that we've got now. And then we moved to Ormskirk in 1933 and we opened our doors to male students in, in 1959. So obviously that was a bit of a change as well. And the university has grown a lot since then. And we've spent um, over 300 million pounds on campus developments. And that's just in the last decade. Uh, so if you've not been to visit us, if you know where we are, you've not been to visit us, for a while do come and have a look because we have changed a lot so you can see some of the developments from this aerial shot and I'll talk about the facilities in more detail shortly but I'll just point out some of the buildings that you can see from this photograph so the 25 million pound sports centre is in the bottom left hand side of the screen and you can also see, see some of the surrounding sports fields as well. The blocks of buildings around campus that all look quite similar are our award-winning halls of residence. And we have nearly two and a half thousand single study bedrooms on campus, which are mainly used for first years. But we now have 25 townhouses. Uh, they're exclusively for third year students as well. Um, and that's really close to the library. So they can just kind of hop along to there when they're doing their dissertations. The green colour building in between the halls of residence middle left of the photograph in between the lake and the car park is our creative edge building and that's an 18 million pound facility which houses amongst lots of other things recording studios and our industry standard film and tv production equipment as well in the top middle of the picture you can see our catalyst building uh, and this houses our library careers and student support services and that was opened in 2018 at a cost of 27 million pounds so it's a really lovely high-tech building um, it's really airy, there's lots of computers for students to use, lots of social spaces, but there's also quiet study areas and bookable group areas as well. Um, it really is a firm favourite with not, the, not just the students, but the staff as well. Um, and actually it's, it's got the best sandwiches. So I think that's always a good recommendation. So I think they're the best sandwiches on campus. So you can also see in the left centre of the picture, the original main building, and that's the building that's in the shape of the H. And that's roughly in the centre of campus. And the buildings on the other side of that are on our Western campus, we call it. And those include our faculties of, of health building, our faculty of education building. We've got the tech hub over there, geosciences, biosciences, um, our business school and law and psychology buildings are over there as well. Sorry to any buildings that I've left out there. So we're proud to say that we've won and been nominated for numerous awards over the past few years, including being awarded the gold standard in teaching and excellence framework, uh, being one of only three universities the, to win the uh, TEF gold in the Northwest, that the award meant an awful lot to us as it was awarded by the government and it's awarded on the basis um, of the quality of our teaching, our learning environment and our student outcomes, so something that's really close to our heart. I've put some other awards on there too that we've, that we've won or been nominated for. And I think it's important to note that we have a consistently high employment rate amongst graduates as well. Um, and we were nominated for the best job prospects by What Uni for 2022. So I'll, I'll stop talking too much about Edge Hill now, um, but I will use some Edge Hill examples throughout the rest of the presentation to put some things into context. So what are the benefits of higher education for those of you that may be thinking about it? Some of you may already know that you want to move into higher education. So, for example, if you want to become a teacher, you'll need to gain a degree with a recommendation for QTS to be able to do that. If you want to become a nurse or a lawyer or maybe a psychologist, you'll need to gain a degree with certain professional accreditations in order to go into those roles. So necessity and being able to access specialised careers that have specific qualification requirements is one obvious reason for gaining a degree, but there are other benefits too. Just excuse me for a moment. So gaining a degree can really help individuals build confidence, not just on a personal level, but on an academic and intellectual level as well. So we've seen students come back into education as a mature student through an access course and go on to do a PhD and achieve a, doc a doctorate in their chosen subject. So some students, um, you know, really relish the fact that they can study a subject that they love in, in lots of details for three years, and this often leads them directly into a career. However, it's not written in stone that your career must follow the subject that you studied at university. Degrees will teach you a lot of transferable skills that employers look for, and that can be used in any sector or career. Um, in fact, the majority of jobs for graduates don't specify a degree discipline. Employers are often just looking for candidates that have a degree so that they know they'll bring a certain skill set um, to the role. 
So other benefits in include gaining independence, maybe if you've not lived away from home yet, gaining an internationally recognized qualification that you can travel abroad with, making lifelong connections, both on a personal and professional level. And many of the friends that you make at university will be friends for life as well. Um, many of our students also make important professional connections without on placements. And this can be really beneficial when they go, when they come to looking for a job when they graduate as well. So studying at university will give you access to the latest state of the art facilities that are available in the area of your study as well. So for example, at Edge Hill, if you're interested in health courses, we have clinical skills and simulation centre with many of the facilities that you'd expect to find in a hospital. We've got ward simulations with mannequin style robots that can emulate lots of um, feelings and symptoms from uh, having a little bit of a temperature to just actually giving birth. So having a degree is also very likely to increase your earning potential with studies showing that graduates are likely to earn £10,000 a year more than non-graduates. So there's lots of reasons to come to university, but obviously it has to be the right decision for you, um, you know, at the time that you're going to do it. If you do decide that you want to study for a degree, you have a lot of choices available to you. In fact, as of January 2021, there was more than 35,000 undergraduate degrees available to choose from across the UK. Um, and that was at over 343 different um, institutions. So it's really important that you kind of narrow those choices down and make the right choice for you and your situation. So if you decide that university is for you, you'll usually need to gain a qualification at level three. Um, and this qualification will usually need to carry UCAS points. Most universities will set part of their entry requirements as a numerical value and UCAS tariff points translate your qualifications and grades into this numerical value. So, for example, if you did an access to HE diploma, which many mature students do, if they need to either gain those level three qualifications or maybe brush up on some subject knowledge and academic skills, as because quite a lot of mature students may have been out of education for a while, um, so, and, and it actually, in fact, access students may take a, a, an access to HE diploma um, course for both of those reasons, because they've been out of education for a while, um, and also because that they've not quite hit the level three qualifications that we're asking for. So the access to HE diploma usually takes one academic year to complete full time, longer, obviously, if you study, if you choose to study part time, and it teaches you lots of valuable, valuable academic skills alongside that subject knowledge in the area that you choose. So your local college will be able to advise you of what subjects are offered at their institutions if you think you may be interested in access to HE diploma. And your achievements on that course will be measured by UCAS in numbers. So I'll give an Edge Hill example to illustrate. So for paramedic practice, we would ask for between 112 and 120 UCAS points. On an access to HE diploma, this would equate to 15 credits achieved at level three in distinction and 30 credits achieved at level three at merit. And that would give you 112 UCAS points. 24 credits achieved at level three at distinction and 21 credits achieved at level three at merit gives you 122 UCAS points. So that just gives you a little bit of an indication um, of how you can gain those points. So similarly, the grades that you gain at A level and BTEC will also carry UCAS points. Um, and there's lots of other qualifications that carry UCAS points as well. And you can check those out on the UCAS tariff calculator on their website. Um, and you can check if you're, you may have some other level three qualifications or other qualifications that you're not sure what level they are. Um, and the UCAS um, tariff calculator there should be able to tell you how many points, if any, that they carry. It, not all qualifications are on there though. So I would always say it's best to check with each university's entry requirements individually. So I've also listed some alternative routes into higher education on this slide. So you may have heard of degree apprenticeships, which will allow you to work alongside gaining your degree. So these programmes are developed in partnership with employers, universities and also professional bodies. And they combine working with studying part time at a university. So this means that apprentices are employed throughout the programme and they spend part of their time at university and the rest with their employer. And these usually take between three and six years to complete. Another route into higher education could be a foundation year. So this is a, a programme of study offered by universities um, that you can usually undertake before your degree begins. So it's kind of like a year zero. Um, they, you can often um, 
They often have lower entry requirements than the three-year degree, so students might apply for a foundation year for a number of reasons. It could be that they, they don't have the grades uh, for the full degree. Uh, they may have non-traditional qualifications or maybe experience that doesn't carry UCAS points. Um, they may be starting university after some time away from education, um, or they may just be looking for some more support during the transition into university study. So they may want that extra year to acclimatise. Not all universities offer foundation years, and they're often um, only for some specific subjects. So you really need to do your research to check who offers what, if you'd be interested in that. So for example, we only offer foundation year for our medicine programme. Um, another option that you may be able to take and not to be mixed up with a foundation year is a foundation degree. And this qualification is a qualification in its own right, but it will give you the first two years of a degree. Um, and can be topped up to a full degree with a further one, further one year's study as well. Um, if it's full time, it'll be longer if it's part time. Foundation degrees are often offered in more vocational subjects and students often work alongside them as well, either in paid or in voluntary roles. Entry requirements for foundation degrees are often considerably lower than that for a full time undergraduate degree. Um, and so that it can be quite a good stepping stone to gaining a degree. And actually, you can quite often get it in the same amount of time as well. So an example of a foundation degree at Edge Hill is we have our nursing associate programme, and that can be topped up to a full nursing degree with further study. I think it's an extra further two years that you need to do that. Some universities also may offer their own access programme to support students uh, to gain a place on their chosen degree. And this can really vary in length. And again, you'll need to do your research to see which universities offer an access programme. Um, You'll also need to check entry requirements and how long they take to complete because they do vary quite a lot. Uh, the programmes differ from access to HE diplomas that you can take from your local FE college is that they usually only allow you to apply for courses at the university that's running that access course and that's really important. You won't necessarily be able to move to another university with it. Whereas an access to HE diploma will allow you to apply to most universities and for most courses nationwide. So that's a really important distinction. Um, an Edge Hill University example of an access course is our Fast Track course. And that's a free seven week course, which runs every June um, with a smaller cohort at the beginning of the year. Um, and then on successful completion of that course, it'll allow you to join one of our degree programmes, but we can't say that it would allow you to, to join a different um, university's degree programme. But what happens is you learn vital study skills alongside subject knowledge um, and you choose a subject that you would like to go on to and there's quite a few subjects to choose from so that includes teacher training we've got nursing on there as well biology business social sciences etc but each university not all universities have an access course and each university will have their own subjects for it so there may also be extra requirements to study on your chosen degree and my advice would be to really check these out carefully as soon as you start to do your research. Quite often students will focus on the level three qualifications that they need, but forget to check if there's any other qualifications like level two qualifications that they need before they start their course. It's important to do this early so that you can gain these qualifications in time and you can maybe do them alongside a level three qualification if you need to. It's so frustrating for students when they work really hard on the level three qualifications and then find out, you know, too late to do anything about it that they've not got the level two qualifications and then they have to reapply for the following year. You know, it's not the end of the road, but they do have to kind of delay their studies. And it's really frustrating if you've worked really hard on your level threes. So if you don't have the level, level twos that you need, you'll need to do these um, usually before the, the start date of the degree course that you want to go on to. So this can be achieved by either taking the GCSE at your local FE college or maybe online if they're available um, or taking an equivalency course. Um, and these are often available at universities. So we have equivalency courses available in level two literacy and numeracy, um, and also in English, maths and science for the GCSE. Again, we can only guarantee that these courses will be accepted for our own programmes. Um, so make sure that you check where these equivalencies will be accepted when you're making your application. Also check if your chosen course would like you to have some relevant work experience before you apply as well. We do of course recognise that this has been really difficult um, to undertake during the pandemic and most universities have taken this into consideration when considering applications so don't worry about it you know during the last um, 18 months. If you are applying for a competitive course though 
Um, there are industry websites and online resources that can be really useful in giving you more information about a specific sector. So don't just kind of think, oh, I couldn't do my placement. Have a little look around what's available online. Is there any more information you can find out to show that you're passionate about the course? So when it comes to choosing a course, what do you need to consider? Firstly, you need to think, consider for yourself what matters the most to you. Do you want the course to include travel opportunities? Are the employability chances the most important consideration for you? Do you want a course that offers a professional qualification and placement opportunities? Is it important to know how you're taught and how you're assessed? Do you need to have a look into the timetables? You know, if you're choosing a practical course, facilities might be a really important factor for you to consider. So really spend some time thinking about what's important to you. I also thought it might be worth just doing a little bit of jargon busting as we're going along before you do start to do your research because uh, us, we at universities tend to use a lot of abbreviations and terms that can be really confusing. We just kind of use them all the time and forget really sometimes that people aren't born knowing what they all mean. Um, so some of you will already know what these terms mean, but some of you may only just be starting to think about higher education and you may not have heard of them. So I thought I'd just go through a few things. So university courses are often referred to as undergraduate or postgraduate. Postgraduate study is for students who already have a degree. So it's, you know, after your degree. And undergraduate study is for students who don't already have a degree. And the students themselves are often referred to as postgraduate or undergraduate students, respectively. Another term that I think that can be quite confusing is when you see in a course title that it's a BA or a BSc. So you'll see these letters before the title of a degree course, and these refer to the type of degree that it is. So a BA stands for the Bachelor of Arts um, and is an undergraduate degree awarded to those studying in an arts or humanities subject. Um, and a BSc, BSc sorry, stands for Bachelor of Science, and it's an undergraduate degree awarded to those studying a scientific subject. So it kind of it makes sense once it's explained but it just can be a little bit confusing I think when you're looking at course titles some courses have other forms of titles as well depending on the course and subsequent qualifications of the course so for example there's LLB which is a Bachelor of Law there's the MBCHB which is a Bachelor of Medicine and then there's BN which is a um, Bachelor of Engineering so it's always worth a quick google if you're confused anyway because that'll soon bring it to light Another thing that might be worth bearing in mind if you're torn between two subjects or feel that two subjects will be beneficial to you in your, in your future career is that you may actually be able to study two subjects at the same time. So a single honours degree is one where you study one main subject with a variety of modules within that subject and a joint honours degree is made up of two subjects and there'll be modules in both of those subjects. Some subjects will be listed with an AND. For example, we have a course called BA in Criminology and Sociology, and that course has a 50-50 split between those two subjects. Whereas if the subjects are listed using the word with instead of AND between them, they'll usually be split 75% be split in one subject favour. And um, so for example, LLB Law with Politics will be made up of 75% Law and 25% of Politics. And the ONS part in brackets uh, means honours um, and that, you know, whatever type of course it is refers to the level of attainment that you will be able to achieve on that degree. So hopefully that's, that's a bit less confusing for people that may be just coming to, to higher education. Um, faculty is another term uh, that can be confusing when you start your research into university uh, as well. A faculty is basically a, a, a group of university departments, that's, that's all it is. So to use Edge Hill as example, we have three faculties. We've got the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, which is our largest and most diverse faculty. So as you can see, it encompasses our humanities subjects like English and history. We've got performing arts in there, the business school, sports, computing, law, um, social sciences to name but a few. And many of the courses within the faculty carry professional qualifications and accreditations. So for example, many of our business school courses will give you a level five CMI certificate in leadership and management as well as your degree. Um, and our law courses carry LLB accreditation. And that gives graduates exemptions from the academic stage of training to become a solicitor or a barrister. Our second faculty is our faculty of education. And that's got a very well established national reputation for the delivery of high quality initial teacher training. Um, and that's across the full range of age phases, right from early years through to adult education. And this is where our qualifying teaching courses sit. Um, and another abbreviation that you'll see if you're looking for teaching courses is QTS. Um, and that stands for qualified, qualified teacher status. 
Uh, you can also study for non-teaching course, courses within this faculty. Um, and that involves learning around how children of varying ages learn and develop. And these courses would equip you to work in the wider children's workforce. And then our third and final faculty is our Faculty of Health, Social Care and Medicine. And this, maybe unsurprisingly, has our professional health courses. And we've got nursing, midwifery, operating department practitioner, paramedic practice. We've also got social work, counselling and psychotherapy degrees in there as well. Health and social well-being and nutrition and health degrees also sit within this faculty, um, as does our new medicine degree as well, which perhaps isn't surprising from the title. So back to courses, there's a huge amount of courses out there, as we've always as we've had we already said, sorry, at Edge Hill alone, we've got 134 courses available at the university, and that's split over the three faculties that we've just spoken about. So what is a good place to start when thinking about what course you would like to study? So I think the UCAS website is a great starting point for doing your research. UCAS stands for the University and Colleges Admissions Service, and it's the way in which you apply for university if you're applying for a full-time course. And I think sometimes that can put people off because we're a little bit scared of UCAS, but actually there's a wealth of information on there about the courses that are available and the universities uh, that offer those courses as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about the applic application process and how to apply a little bit later on. But I just wanted to highlight that UCAS is a good place to start doing your research. Once you've decided which courses you like to explore, UCAS will show you which universities offer those courses and they'll have links to those university websites as well. And just something that's quite new for UCAS, it's got a new feature called Hub. And this can really help students organise their research and their applications for university. Um, so you can kind of use it as a notebook where you can keep up, you can keep all your updated notes, you can have a personalised landing page accessed from the UCAS website. And there's an explore tool on there as well where you can search subjects and discover courses. And there's also actually a personal statement builder that helps you structure your personal statement as well. And your personal statement is a piece of writing that you'll need to do as part of the application process. It's a really important part of the application process. And I don't wanna panic anybody about it now, but there is some really good resources out there to help you write it. There's also a tariff calculator on there as well for tallying up your UCAS points. Um, and it prompts you as well, which is really important. It prompts you at key dates um, and times of the year to remind you of events and deadlines that are coming up in the application process. There's also a chat function on there as well. I think that you can, um, chat to lots of different uh, current students from different universities so that's really useful as well to get a student perspective. So you can search via subject and via region and that's quite often useful for mature students to be able to search by a region because quite often they might have commitments that means they need to stay in a particular region and then what it does it, it is it provides suggestions based on the choices that you've made and these can be saved to a dashboard if you want to look into them further in the future so have a good look on there and have you know that, that's a really good starting point to have a look at what options are available to you so obviously once you've chosen your, chosen your course you'll need to choose the university that you would like to study at and back to the question what matters the most to you so what type of university would you like to go to? And we'll talk about the different types in a moment. Are social opportunities important to you? Is the size of the uni important to you? Is the location important as it is for, for lots of um, students? You know, if you've got care and responsibilities, if you've already got a, a job that you're hoping to keep on with your studies, if you've already got a mortgage, you're gonna need to stay um, and, and commute to university rather than traveling away. If you do want to move away, do you want to live in university accommodation? Uh, so there may be other factors that are important to you, such as sports facilities as well, student support, reputation of the university. So just a quick note on the types of university that you can study at. Um, there are campus universities, which Edge Hill is an example of, as I've, I've already mentioned. Um, um, so that just basically means that everything that you need to study, live and socialize is on the one site. Um, you know you don't need to move off that site if you don't want to everything is there a city university is usually spread across the city so you may have your accommodation in one part of the city a lecture in another part like we said a collegiate is a higher education institution that's divided up into a series of colleges um, and i think probably the most well-known examples are probably oxford and cambridge of those those are collegiate universities 
And then another term that you might hear is Russell Group University. Um, Russell Group Universities refer to the older, very research intensive universities. So hopefully you'll know what those mean if anybody say that. If facilities are something that are important to you, so if they're, you know, if they're going to really help you when you're learning on your course, make sure that you do your research around that too. Facilities, like we said, are going to be more important to some courses than others. So, for example, if you're applying for a professional health course, it would be a good idea to check what practical facilities your university, your university choices can offer you. Um, here's a list of some of our facilities. I'm not going to read through them all, but I'll talk through the images that are on the slide there. So the top picture is an image of our mooting room, which is a mock courtroom, and that's used by our law and policing students. The photograph on the left is taken in our police training and simulation building, which is a repurposed detached house, um, which includes a furbished police station and questioning rooms in there as well. We can also set up crime scenes so that students can search for forensic evidence and practice questioning suspects. Um, and that's with full police video and facilities. I think our students refer to it as the crime house. Um, I'm not sure how happy the local residents are about that because it makes it sound really dodgy, but it's really not. It's actually a teaching facility. If you hear people talk about the crime house at Edge Hill, it's not, it's not dodgy. It's a, it's a good teaching facility. Uh, the photo bottom right is a picture of one of our dance studios that are part of our performing arts facilities and that also includes two theatres where we host many professional performances in dance, drama, musicals and comedy as well as obviously the student performances. Other buildings on campus uh, which we have very briefly mentioned already include our £30 million tech hub and that boasts the cave which is the UK's first 3D super immersive virtual environment. Our law and psychology building has numerous laboratories with state-of-the-art eye trackers. We've got an EEG lab in there and that measures brain activity. We've got a transcranial magnetic simulation observation lab. I have to read that, sorry, I, I can't remember it. I have to read it off my notes. Uh, with booth and filming equipment. We've got a pain lab, which again sounds really dodgy, but it's really not. It's all sort of psychological um, equipment uh, with nerve and muscle simulator. We've got virtual reality equipment, you know, we've got lots of, of different equipment for the courses. Um, and we also have buildings dedicated to biosciences and geosciences as well. And they've got really impressive modern laboratories and DNA extraction and analysis equipment in there too. Try not to leave anybody out in case they see the presentation. So some of our other recent developments are listed on here. So the picture on the top is our, is our clinical skills and simulation center. And this is the building in which all of our health students will spend a lot of their time using state-of-the-art facilities that are housed in there. So we've got a ward simulation, which you can see on the top picture there. Uh, we've also got operating theaters, um, industry standard equipment, as well as the robot style mannequins that I've mentioned as well. We also have two 3D uh, virtual dissection tables where students or tutors can be the scalpel and can actually cut through the body. Um, and this demonstrates the different structures of the body. You can see how blood flows, you can examine CT and MRI scans on there. So they really are, you know, state of the art. And I think all of these facilities are really important to help students feel um, confident when they go out into onto the placements. So for example, students can practice taking blood on an arm that doesn't feel any pain. Um, our ODP operating department practitioner students can practice intubating on, an, you know, on a, a robotic mannequin before they try on a real patient. So it can really help with confidence. And then the bottom left photo is one of our halls of residence. Um, and we've recently undertaken a huge refur refurbishment project on our older accommodation as well. Uh, the final picture on the bottom right is our law and psychology building um, and that unsurprisingly houses psychology, law and criminology students in there and again it's got its own lecture theatre, it's got a seminar, tutorial rooms, lots of social spaces for the students as well. And then just a few words about accommodation. I know a lot of mature students won't require accommodation uh, but some of you will be able to and will want to move out, um, you know, away from home into student accommodation. So I'll run through a few details about living arrangements on campus for those of you who are thinking about maybe living on a campus. So there's lots of different types of accommodation available at different rental costs um, and rental costs really do vary quite a lot, depending on where the accommodation has on suite facilities or whether it's a shared bathroom whether it's catered or self-catered makes a big difference as well. And it also varies greatly depending on where the university is in the country, um, as, as obviously any property in London, for example, is gonna be more expensive than a similar property in the Northwest. So that makes a big difference. 
There's also the option of looking for your own private accommodation as well in the town or the city centre. And it's actually the job of the accommodation teams at university to support students in their search for the right of living arrangements, whether that's on or, or off campus, they can support you with that. So another thing you might want to research is what the student experience might be like, might be like at each university that you're interested in. I think a lot of mature students might worry that they're gonna be the only mature student on the course. And this is so unlikely to be the case. We've got a lot of mature students here at Edge Hill. I think in fact, uh, over a quarter of our entire student body is made up of, of mature students. And actually that statistic is a lot higher for some of the courses. So if you are classed as a mature student, you certainly won't have to worry that you're gonna be the only one when you come to university because there's lots of mature students at university. Another thing uh, that's often a huge priority for mature students is career opportunities, uh, because obviously you, you quite often have financial commitments that you have to take into consideration before you even start thinking about higher education. So really make sure that you do your research about what your chosen university can offer you in terms of career support and development. Uh, so using Edge Hill as an example again, all of our courses have employability built into them. And many have a specific employability module in the third year as well. Employees are uh, often invited in as guest lecturers throughout the year. Um, our professional practice placements, for, obviously a lot of our courses have professional practice placements in there. Um, so placements in a hospital setting for professional health programmes, placements in schools for our teaching courses. They are an essential part of the learning experience. And they also enable students to, to meet the requirements of the professional side of their course. Um, so that they gain their degree and their professional qualifications. So those are obviously mandatory. Um, but we do also recognise the importance of work experience for the courses that may not include a professional qualification or work experience as part of, of, the, of the course. Um, and we know that work experience can develop industry knowledge, it can build transferable skills and also help you to start building professional wealth, uh, networks as well that can help you when you're looking for a job after graduation. So we have dedicated placement officers across all three faculties whose primary, ro primary role is to, to find value adding placements um, for our students in the sector or industry that they want to go in, not just those that already have a professional placement built in. Our careers team are also in contact with you throughout your degree to invite you to industry specific job fairs. Um, and to offer them any services as well. And so that can include, you know, what you would expect from a careers team as well, like writing a job application, building a great CV. They can do mock interviews as well, and they will continue to support you after you become a graduate as well um, for, for the years after, after you've graduated. Other career enhancing opportunities that you could look out for when researching your course could include study abroad opportunities, if that's something that you're able to do. <coughs> excuse me, these can last for one semester or for a whole academic year. Many degree courses can also offer you the opportunity to have a sandwich year, which is also known as an internship or an industry placement. And these usually last for 12 months and they're usually taken between years two and years three of your degree course. And sandwich, sandwich years are a great way to gain some really valuable experience before you graduate um, so that you can really stand out to employers when you do start looking for a job after graduation. And then also look out for shorter term career enhancing opportunities as well that can be taken up throughout your studies. So at Edge Hill, we've got what we call the Student Experience Fund, and I'm sure other universities have, have similar things. So this is a pot of money of up to £2,000 that can be accessed by students to take part in activities that enhance their employability. So it's entirely what up to you what you use the money for, but it must be a career enhancing and you must justify it by way of an application process. So unfortunately, you can't just say, I think it really helped my career if I went to Hawaii for a month. <laughs> you have to justify, you know, how that's going to help your employability. So some of the activities that our students have used the fund for include performing arts students traveling to New York. So they're still doing fun things. They've thought about it very carefully. Tra traveling to New York to perform at the um, US launch of the Oxford Handbook of Dance and Wellbeing. Another of our students made a feature length documentary um, following up on students' experiences in light of the Time Up movement. And a group of health students attended a placement in China arranged through Harbin Medical University. So there's lots of different things you can do and you don't have to use it to travel abroad. You can use it in this country. If you're not able to travel abroad, if you've got family commitments, you can certainly use it to do something in this country, maybe fund a work placement. Um, or you know an opportunity somewhere more local. 
We've also got other career and development enhancing opportunities like learning another language. Um, and this can also involve an option to travel abroad as well for, for a semester. So just a quick word about scholarships. Uh, because they're monetary awards that can really help students financially. A scholarship is funded directly from the university and the universities will set their own criteria for who can apply. So they normally reward excellence or focus on lower income families to support them to help them to come university to help them to come to university. So some scholarships are guaranteed if you fulfill certain criteria, some need to be applied for as part of a competitive process. Some scholarships form part of a fee waiver so you can get money off tuition fees and some are cash rewards for you to spend on whatever you like. Um, and they can be achieved through a variety of methods in a variety of areas and activities. And you really do need to do your research on each university that you're applying for to see what scholarships they offer. So just a couple of the, the ones that we offer at Edge Hill. Uh, we've got the Excellence Scholarship, which rewards students who demonstrate termination commitment and achievement outside of their studies. So this could be in absolutely any area whatsoever. So in the past, scholarships have been awarded to students for excellence in creative arts, in enterprise, performing arts, volunteering, but that, that's not a conclusive list. It can be in absolutely any area. It's worth 2000 pounds, like we said, paid in four installments. Um, so it's really worth having. And I always say that if you think you might qualify for scholarship, please fill out a form. The scholarships are quite often underapplied for and it's effectively free money that could really help you with your studies is to spend on whatever you want to spend it on. So I would say it's definitely worth, worth you know, an hour, two hours of your time to fill out that application form and see if you, you know, you, you might be awarded one of those scholarships. We've got a sports scholarship as well and there's three levels of that uh, with the gold award being worth thousand pounds per year to support you in your sport. Um, and it's also worth mentioning that you need to progress in both your sporting and academic pursuits for the sporting scholarship as well. So make sure you're keeping both of those up to date to have that renewed annually. Um, you can apply for both those scholarships once you've firmly accepted a place with us. So you can get straight onto it once you, you know, once you have accepted a place. And I'm sure that's similar with other universities as well. We've also got a high achiever scholarship for students who achieve 144 UCAS points or more from their level three qualifications. So if we put this in an access to HE diploma context, that would be 45 credits at distinction. So it really is for those students that you know, are, are achieving the highest. And that's one of the scholarships that's awarded automatically because obviously we know what you've achieved. So we can just award that automatically, but check out the eligibility criteria for the scholarships. So universities really differ in what they offer students extra to their degree courses. Uh, so I think, have a think about what's important to you and have a look out there to see what universities are offering and see if you've got, you know, if you can find a good fit for you. Now, student support is another area that's really important to spend some time researching, I think. Make sure that your chosen university has the support in place that you might need over the course of your studies. I think, you know, it'd be naive to think that the three years that you spend studying for your degree are all gonna be plain sailing. Studying for a degree is really enjoyable and it can be life changing, but it can also present some challenges and sometimes life can throw you a curveball that just kind of makes studying alongside getting on with all your day to day tasks quite difficult. But universities have teams of dedicated and experienced staff that can help and advise you if you hit a bit of a barrier along the way and you're finding things to be tough. Um, these are just some of the teams that we have at Edge Hill University. Um, that can help you if you're struggling academically or personally or maybe both throughout your time and you, other universities are the same you know we we really want students to know that we're there for them because when you don't need us you're not looking for us but we're trying to make you aware, aware that you know student support is out there ready for you if you do hit a bit of a barrier if you're having a bit of a, a tough time come and speak to us we've got people that are ready to help you. So just a few of the things there, we've got special support available for care leavers. Um, we've also got a wellbeing and counselling team to help you if you're feeling anxious or finding university difficult in any way. We can just give you that little bit of extra help. We have our disability support team will work with you to ensure that you have individually tailored support during your time studying as well. There's the SPLD team who offer advice, guidance, support and assessment for students with specific learning difficulties as well. And also something that, that's worth noting is that the quicker you tell a university about any maybe learning needs that you have, the quicker they can put something in place for you when you start as well. So make sure you're declaring that on your application form. 
it's not going to go against you in your application at all. It's not something that we use to think, oh, no, we're, we're not going to take that person on. We want to know solely so that we can help you when you come to university. Our transition team can help you with uh, that sometimes tricky sort of transition into university life and help you kind of stay on track with your studies as well, both on a personal level and an academic level. We also have chaplaincy for pastoral guidance and support for multiple, multiple faiths as well. And our careers team we've already spoken about a little bit as well. Uh, we've got a campus life team as well who will help you settle in if you are living on campus. Um, keep you up to date with what's happening on campus and last but by no means least we have our money advice team and they can offer advice on budgeting on financial health um, on student funding so please make sure you know you're using those if you need to as well so as we've already said UCAS is a great starting point for your research um, and university websites will probably be your next point of call to do your next part of research. So they can contain lots of detailed information about their campus, about their courses, about their facilities, about their student support. Um, and then usually we'd be advising you to go to as many open days as possible as well when you're doing your research. And open days are days that the universities host to give potential students a chance to have a look around, get a feel of a university, see if you can imagine yourself being there for the next three years or so. They tend to run from June to November. And in fact, we had our first on-campus open day last weekend, um, which was lovely because we were actually seeing people. We were having people coming onto campus. So that was just super exciting. We loved it. And then we're supporting those events with some Q&A sessions around subjects um, tonight, tomorrow and Thursday. So if you want to book onto any of those, obviously, feel free to do that. Um, I think. Obviously, lots of people have only had virtual sessions to attend and they've been great. And I think, you know, universities have done really well in, in trying to get that information out there for people. But I think if you can get to a physical campus, um, if universities are open to do um, campus tours, open to, to host open days, then I would say definitely go along because you can really get a feel for the university. I always think kind of choosing a university is a bit like buying a house. You kind of get onto campus and you know, it's kind of like, yeah, this is the place I can imagine myself being here for the next three years. So if, you, if there are opportunities to go onto campus, then please use them. Um, there's all sorts of things going on. There's, you know, you can speak to the academics directly. You can speak to student finances quite often, workshops on applying to university about writing your personal statements. So, you know, they are really useful. Also as well, use, um, make sure that you're using social media because there's blogs, there's blogs on there. Uh, there's Facebook, there's Twitter, all the usual things. And we, you know, universities are putting on lots of information on there as well, because we know people are struggling to find information about the university at the moment. So I'll just say a few quick words about the application process. Um, it might be a bit premature to be talking in too much detail about it today. Um, and there's obviously lots to consider and there'll be plenty of opportunity to be, get lots of support with your applications. Um, so don't worry about it too much at the moment, but just a little word. Um, as we've mentioned, you apply for most university courses via UCAS. Certainly if they're full time, it'll be through UCAS. Occasionally, if you're applying for a part time course, you might apply directly to the university. But that information is going to be on the website. So UCAS provide an online system. You get up to five choices of courses in the university. And the application form is split into a few different sections. And what happens is you'll create a login and a password when you first register for UCAS. And that means that you don't have to fill the whole application form out in one go. You can log back in and carry on with it. So there's a section on personal details, your university and course choices, past education and employment's on there, and then a personal statement section, which we've, we've mentioned briefly. Now, the personal statement section is an important part of the application process because this is the part which you're required to tell the university why you're applying for their course um, and then evidence the skills that you've got that will make you an asset in that university and also in your career as well if it carries a professional qualification. And like I said, there's going to be lots of support available from both the universities and the tutors if you're studying at the time of application. So don't worry too much about your personal statement at this time. It's just kind of a bit of a heads up. Some courses will interview as well. But again, there's plenty of support available to help you with preparation for interview and interview techniques. So don't don't let interviews put you off applying to particular courses uh, because there's lots of support around that as well. And then just a quick word about student finance to finish. 
it's a bit of a minefield. It's quite complicated student finance. So I'm really going to just cover the absolute basics now just to kind of tell you that there is support available out there. I do have a detailed presentation, as I'm sure lots of universities have, that is pre-recorded that we can send out to people if you, if you need more details on it. But obviously those figures are subject to change as well. So just bear that in mind. So university usually costs £9,250 per year for UK students. Uh, and those are your tuition fees. So for non-UK students, please get in touch with us directly to discuss your circumstances because the figures are a little bit different. There are no upfront fees um, for going to university because most people will be able to access the tuition fee loan if you're a UK student to cover these fees. You can also access a maintenance loan that can help uh, you pay for living costs while you study as well. And you'll only start to pay back these loans once you've finished university and you're earning over, <coughs> excuse me, £27,295 a year. Oh, it's definitely too long a presentation when my voice goes. Apologies, I hope you've all had a pause and a break. So if for any reason your earnings fall below that threshold, your repayments will automatically stop until you're earning over that amount again. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's all done automatically, so you don't need to worry about it. Now, there's also extra support available, including childcare grants, learning disability allowances, adult dependent grants, and other forms of support. And that's money that you don't have to pay back. If it says loan, you need to pay it back. If it's grants or allowances, you don't need to pay it back. Um, so it's really worth doing your research uh, to make sure that you're accessing all of the support that's available to you out there as well. Um, oh, also as well, it's worth mentioning, if you're on one of the uh, specified professional health courses, you could also be entitled to a £5,000 training um, grant as well. And again, that's money that you don't have to pay back. There may also be further support available for shortage subjects um, and also for childcare costs as well through that grant. So make sure that you're really having a look to make sure that you're accessing everything that you possibly can. Repayments for the loans are taken monthly, automatically, and I've just put a few figures on there to give you an idea of how much you'd expect to pay back. So the amount you repay will be linked to your income and repayments are calculated according to how much you earn and not how much you owe. And that's actually a really important point. So each year you'll be expected to pay 9% of your income that is above the, pay, the repayment threshold. So, for example, if your salary is £30,000 per year with a repayment threshold of £27,295 a year, the 9% repayment would only apply to £2,705 because that's what's above the repayment threshold. So meaning that actually you would only repay about £20 a month back. So if your income falls below the repayment threshold for any reason, you don't have to make any repayments until your income rises above that threshold again. And like I said, it's done automatically. Um, and any money that's still owed after 30 years is written off and you don't have to pay it back. And actually a lot of people don't end up paying back the entirety of their student loan. So just a few a few figures there on, on student finance, just to kind of make you realise that we, there is support available. So to conclude, this is hopefully a useful checklist for you and a list of topics and areas that we've covered. So your starting point is going to be the course that you're interested in and really spend time researching that course. How is it taught? Will that suit you? Uh, will it lead you through to your career if that's what you want to do? Then what type of university would suit you best? Do you need to stay close to home or would you prefer to move away? And then a really important one is the entry requirements. Do you have everything you, that, you, that you need already or do you need to kind of look into topping up some of your qualifications and how can you do that? Are there any extra opportunities available at the universities? Are there scholarships? You know, is there employment support? Make sure that you're accessing all the information that's out there. So attend open days. There's HE fairs as well. <clears throat> And just on that note, we're planning on hosting a HE fair on the Ornsket campus in September, um, where we will be re represented as a university, obviously, but also quite a, a few of the other universities for the region are going to attend as well. So you'll be able to visit stands there of, the, of each of the universities, find out more information about the courses. There'll also be workshops on student finance, how to apply, how to write a personal statement. So lots of support available. So if you'd like to attend them, please visit our website and book a place on there. 
So I've put my email address on there in case you have any questions that we've not covered today. Um, you know, it doesn't have to just be about introduction to HE, about EdChill, it can be about absolutely anything to do with the, with the HE process. Um, and if I can't answer it, I'll certainly signpost you to somebody that can. Um, so I'll shush now because my voice is completely going, uh, but thanks for listening, everyone. Thank you so much, Louise. That was such an interesting talk. I really love hearing about all the different opportunities available um, specifically for uh, mature learners as well. Also, just to say that we part of Hello, as part of Hello Future Live, we did a whole week on student finance. So if you are looking for information on student finance, we have a talk from Edge Hill University on their student finance options, as well as other universities as well. This has been the final week of Hello Future Live. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, all of our talks are available on our YouTube channel. We have a whole playlist dedicated to Hello Future Live of which this will now be uploaded to. So thank you so much again, Louise, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, you too, Rosa. Bye. Bye.